Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise His name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all His angels praise proclaim. All His hosts together praise Him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise Him, O ye hand of heaven, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praise Let them praise us, give Jehovah, for His name alone is high. And His glory, and his glory is exalted. And His glory, and his glory is exalted. And His glory is exalted. And his glory and his Exalted far above the earth and sky. Let them praises give Jehovah, they were made at his command. Then forever he established, his decree shall never stand. From the earth, O oh, praise Jehovah, all ye floods, ye dragons, all. Fire and hail and snow and vapor, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them, Let them praise us, give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory, and his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted. His and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Well, today we are continuing our study of the miracles of Christ, and this will be our wrap up. Our conclusion, as you can see here, this is lesson 14. We've been looking at these miracles as they're presented in the Gospels for the purpose of understanding the significance of honoring Jesus, glorifying our Lord, showing His power and His compassion and His deity, but also significantly, what is that purpose for us? What can we glean and how can our lives be improved? and brought into accordance with God's will through an understanding and awareness of these miracles that our Lord performed. So today we will look at Jesus' final trek to Jerusalem. And then we'll do a brief overview of what we've studied thus far. There's not any miracles that we'll be discussing on this final journey. We'll just wrap it up for the sake of context and see our Lord's ministry coming to its conclusion. After the resurrection of Lazarus, Jesus will make that tour, his final tour of the region, to the north and then back south and then back to the west to conclude at Bethany and then on to Jerusalem for the last week. John records in the 11th chapter that Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the region near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. After the resurrection of Lazarus, the Jewish leaders conspire how they must get rid of this so-called Messiah, and Lazarus also. And so Jesus no longer walks publicly among them. This final journey that Jesus makes will take him through Samaria, to the north, and Galilee, and Luke tells us this, while he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. So here we see on the map, there's Bethany, there's Ephraim, and Samaria, Galilee, and then he will conclude back at Bethany. And so again, following the resurrection of Lazarus, he went to a city called Ephraim, and he stays there with the disciples. John doesn't tell us how long. He stays there. But he continues immediately after that saying, the Passover of the Jews was near. And many went up to Jerusalem from the country prior to the Passover in order to purify themselves. 
Now, many of the biblical scholars trying to harmonize the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those synoptics, and then with the Gospel of John, are the opinion that when the Passover was getting near, Jesus went from Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples, John tells us, northward through Samaria into the southern or southeastern portion of Galilee and then south to Perea. Mark, Matthew, and Luke all say that Jesus traveled from Galilee through Perea. And from Perea, they're on the east side of the Jordan. There he will make his way to Bethany and then to Jerusalem. So here we see on the map from Ephraim north through Samaria, the southern part of Galilee, from Galilee through Perea, Perea to Bethany, and Bethany that short walk in this final week to Jerusalem. Many people came to Jerusalem, of course, to observe the Passover and to see Jesus and Lazarus. John says it is a spectacular occasion that's taking place as word has spread. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there. And they came, not on account of Jesus only, but so that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. So there we see the hardness of heart, the failure to repent, to come to belief. It carries them to such an extent of being willing to murder for the sake of their own safekeeping. So, this miracle that Jesus performed of the resurrection of Lazarus, bringing him back to life when he'd been in the tomb for four days, so there's no doubt about him uh, being dead, that just increased the hatred that they had, these Jewish leaders, about Jesus and his teachings. Their conspiracy gives us clear evidence of the hardness of their hearts. And a, a warning to us that it's possible to have good intentions, to be motivated by uh, what they call were holy desires, but to be completely anti-God's will. Their hardness of heart caused them to refuse to hear Jesus, refuse to repent and to believe in Him. John begins his gospel with an introduction of what's going to take place to Jesus' ministry. Way back in John chapter 1, John introduces Jesus. And then his rest of the gospel will tell the story of Jesus. He says, This was the true light that coming into the world enlightens every person. He was in the world. And the world came into being through him. And yet the world did not know him. He came to his own. And his own people did not accept him. And there is the bitter irony that the very people who are supposed to be awaiting the Messiah, so many reject him, but not all. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And that being born again will only be possible because Jesus sets His face toward Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, He will pray, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from Me. But nevertheless, not My will, Thy will be done. And so Jesus will go to the cross bearing the sins of the world, bringing salvation to all who will receive Him who will believe in Him, turn to Him, follow Him, be immersed into Him and be born again. Not by the will of man, but born again by the will of God. So let's review the miracles that we saw that are intended to bring us to belief that we will respond in faith to follow Jesus, to name Him as our Lord as well as our Savior. 
The miracles that Jesus performed, recorded by the gospel writers, demonstrate his authority. His authority to teach. And this is why he comes, actually. He doesn't come to perform miracles. He comes to teach, to inform, to instruct about the will of God. His authority over Satan. His authority over sickness is demonstrated so many times in his compassion as he heals those who are afflicted of various illnesses, maladies. And his authority over the very laws of nature to walk on water, to calm the seas, to reproduce food in abundance, to bring wine out of simple water. John, having introduced his gospel, saying Jesus came to his own, and his own refused him, but as many as received him, he gave power to become children of God, concludes his gospel with these words. Many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. The Gospels are not a, a, an exhaustive presentation of the miracles of Jesus. They are highlights. The Holy Spirit guides these writers, Matthew, John, apostles, Mark, and Luke, we call more prophets, the Holy Spirit guides them and brings to their remembrance what should be presented. But not everything is set forth. Many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe. Believe what? Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have Life in his name. So let's review some of these miracles that we studied together in our past weeks. His first miracle recorded in John, the second chapter. Jesus turned water into wine and his ministry begins. That also sets him on the path toward the conflict with the Jewish leaders. Because... That miracle will reveal that the old law is coming to an end. Jewish ceremonialism is going to be replaced by a new covenant. A covenant which is the New Testament of Jesus sealed in His blood. There were miracles that Jesus performed. We saw them in Matthew chapter 8 where Jesus healed a leper. He healed the servant of a centurion. Showing us that God's grace was extended beyond the Jewish community. Was extended to the outsider. And challenges us to always be alert to that outsider. To the hurting world around us. To be able to offer, in the name of Jesus, the concern, the compassion, the benefit, the help, the assistance, the love that Jesus would display. In Mark, the second chapter, Jesus healed a paralytic, but not only healed him, he pronounced him forgiven. And the lesson there was that healing of the body is important. We are all interested in bodily health, physical health. But there is another healing that's even more important. That's the spiritual healing. The healing of the soul is the deepest need that humanity has. And Jesus is able to do both. He can do the less important, healing the body, and we pray for healing, don't we? We visit physicians. We practice good hygiene and, and health matters. And that's important. It's significant. But how many individuals will be very concerned about their physical health, but neglect completely their spiritual well-being, which is the most important of the ultimate concern to the Lord? Healing the soul is the deepest need that we have. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus, asleep in the boat, is awakened by the disciples who said, Lord, don't you care? Here's a storm. We're perishing. And Jesus displayed His power, His authority over nature. We said, peace, be still. And the waves stilled. And the sea of Galilee became like glass. All of that taught us that storms are inevitable. 
There is no escaping storms of life. The tribulation that Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And as Jesus overcame, so we also will overcome. Eventually. In time. And in God's way. And it may be the overcoming will take place only at death. When we graduate to glory. Storms will come. And storms come to believers as well as non-believers. There is no immunity that's granted to believers because we're Christians. Therefore, we won't have any storms of life. We won't have any tribulation. Everything will be smooth sailing, blue skies, rainbows all of our, all of our days. No. Storms come to everyone. It's the way that we respond that separates believers from non-believers. In Matthew chapter 7, you recall that Jesus spoke about, there it is, he concludes his marvelous sermon on the mount that Scott is bringing lessons on Sunday by Sunday. That Jesus speaks of builders, a wise builder and a foolish builder. And that teaching that Jesus gives about the builders tells us that some storms teach us that we're not the ones in control. We cannot control where the tornado will hit or the earthquake or the other adversity that may strike us. We're not in control, but God is. And storms do not mean God has forsaken us. Because we're experiencing trouble or tribulation or adversity does not equate to God rejecting us and forgetting us. He is right there in the storm, just as Jesus was in the storm. And storms teach us, ultimately, the great lesson, Jesus can be trusted. We can commit our lives to Him, and He will never disappoint. He may not respond in the way we would like. He may not respond by our timetable, by our calendar. But Paul assures believers, we know we know, in Romans 8th chapter, that God causes all things, not some, not most, not just about everything, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love the Lord and who are called according to His purpose. So, storms are inevitable. How shall we respond to the storms? Jesus said, He that hears these sayings of mine and does them, He's like a wise person builds his house on the rock. The one who hears these sayings of mine but does not do them, he's the foolish person that builds his house on the sand. Jesus' miracles certainly reveal his compassion. Compassion to the disciples, they were frightened. They were concerned. And he had compassion on them to, and demonstrated his love as well as his power. Demonstrates his compassion to those who were in bondage to demons as he cast out demons from various individuals during his ministry. To a, in this section, to a woman who was impoverished, uh, uh, sickened by a malady, and as well as a member of the elite who needed assistance. He had prestige, unlike the woman. He was influential, unlike the woman. And Jesus shows compassion to those individuals. They all, in that setting that we studied, found themselves to be helpless. They could not remedy the situation on their own. But they were not without hope. Jesus was the answer. And of course, that application for you and me is that when we find ourselves in desperate straits, the answer is to always look to Jesus, who is the master of the storm. In John chapter 5, Jesus demonstrated himself to be Lord of the sufferer. His compassion is great, but also Lord of the Sabbath. And he teaches that the Sabbath, that day of rest, was made for man. Not the other way around. Man was not created in order to keep an arbitrary law of observing a day. But rather, that day is for the benefit of man. To rest. 
to meditate upon God. And Jesus demonstrated that he is Lord of both sufferer and Sabbath. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. That's at that pool of Bethesda. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up the mat and walked out. And what a sight that must have been, as here a man had been there for 38 years, well known to all the observers there, at the word of Jesus, arises, picks up his mat, puts it over his shoulder, and then walks out to the amazement of the other individuals there at the pool. That was done, however, on the day of rest, on the Sabbath. Each of the Gospels described how Jesus multiplied the food to feed over 5,000 individuals. John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all described that event, marvelous event, and demonstrates that God is not the God of scarcity, of meager provisions, but our God is the God of abundance, more than enough. Disciples were, at that time, the channels of blessing. They're the ones who distributed the loaves and the fish to the multitudes. God used them. It wasn't required. The Lord could have simply made the bread and fish miraculously appear in the minds and the hands of the individuals. But he did not do that. He had the disciples distributed, showing that disciples are to be channels of blessing, conduits of God's love, to meet the needs of individuals with the provisions of God. We are God's handiwork. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's workmanship. That's why we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Jesus traveled to the non Jewish areas of Syrophoenicia, major cities of Tyre and Sidon, and there in Again, some irony. Jesus encounters individuals of, who are non-Jewish, whose faith is stronger than the Jewish communities. Mark 7, Matthew 15, there is a Gentile mother. And Jesus commends her for her faith. And there is a powerless pagan man. As Jesus tours through that region, and no doubt there were others that were also healed, blessed, benefited, and many miracles performed. Jesus was showing that the gospel was not only for a select few, that the gospel is for all. The good news of that coming kingdom was to be shared to everyone, the Gentiles as well as the Jews. And God's love was not restricted to only his people, the Jewish nation at that time. It was for the nations. And Jesus demonstrated that. It's a lesson that would be difficult for the apostles, because in the Jewish mindset, they were the only ones that God was interested in. After all, they were the covenant people. They were the ones that had received the promise of Abraham. They were the ones who received the law of Moses. And therefore, how could God be concerned or in, even interested in these Gentiles? And yet the whole purpose of that law, it was added because of sin. It did not remove or prohibit that promise that God made Abraham 400 years earlier. Paul writes about this extensively in Galatians, the third chapter. He says that law was added because of sin until the seed should come. The promise to Abraham was that there would be one who would come from a great nation. And in him, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Back in Genesis chapters 11 and 12 and following. 
the Jewish nation somehow forgot that part of it. And they focused only on themselves. There will be a lesson that Peter will have to be taught in a miraculous way. And he's taken into that household of the Gentile Cornelius. And then he'll finally see, now I know that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, those who obey him, who do his will, are accepted by him. Jesus tried teaching that lesson to his apostles in that Syrophoenician area of uh, Tyre and Sidon. And the people responded, many of them in ways of faith that his own Jewish audience had failed to do. And that message that overrides all that to his disciples was and is, the gospel is for all. We might have a tendency sometimes to think that there are some people who are outside of God's grace. And we just don't want to have anything to do with them. Uh, They're living lives that are in violation of God's will. They have lifestyles that we don't approve of because uh, they are sinful based upon Bible teachings. That doesn't mean they're to be, uh, that they're to be ignored. They, all people, need the gospel. The gospel is what's the power of God to salvation. To everyone that believes, Paul says in Romans the first chapter, to the Jew first, but also the Greek. That all individuals are in sin, and the only remedy to sin is the gospel, the blood of Christ. And it's a lesson that every disciple in every age is to learn. And that resurrection of Lazarus, revealing that Jesus has authority even over life and death, That resurrection of Lazarus revealed Jesus to be the one who conquers death ultimately. That death is not the victor. That death is not the final word. There is resurrection. Of course, in Lazarus' case, he would die again. He was resurrected by the compassion of the Lord and the power of Jesus. He would live his life and then would fall asleep in death in time, as all do, unless the Lord comes first. But Jesus is the one who tells us to look beyond the grave. I am the resurrection and the life. I am, Jesus says. The one who believes in me will live, even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Meaning spiritually. We'll never die spiritually. That spiritual separation from God. That's that promise. He who lives and believes in me will never die. And then that question, that is piercing question to every one of us. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? So then many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples. Which aren't written in this book. These have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father God, we're thankful for Your Word. Your Word which is inspired And as builds us up, gives us an inheritance among the saints in light. We thank you, Father, for Jesus, all that he means to us, for your word that reveals him, for the miracles he performed, which demonstrates so boldly his compassion, his power, his authority, his love. Help us, Father, to apply your teachings into our lives that we might grow closer to you, And be more in the likeness of your Son and our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
I still have peace. I still have 
peace after all.